Stanford University. Hi, I'm Ewan Ashley, a cardiologist and assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Thank you for submitting your questions over the last two weeks. I've enjoyed reading them, and thank you for submitting so many. Over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to answer six of the top-ranked questions. The first question was about mitral valve prolapse. The mitral valve is one of the four valves in the heart, and it's one of the valves that lets the blood into the main pumping chamber of the heart. Prolapse means that it falls backwards into the filling chamber of the heart. And mitral valve prolapse in and of itself, we used to think was very common, perhaps as common as one in 20 people in the population. But once we learned how to measure it properly using an ultrasound of the heart, I think we got a clearer idea that perhaps it's less frequent, more like one in 100 in the population. And mitral valve prolapse itself is not necessarily a problem. If you're diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse, you should go and follow up with your doctor or cardiologist every five years and have an ultrasound of the heart. The main problem with mitral valve prolapse happens if the valve starts to leak. And your doctor might refer to this as mitral regurgitation because the blood regurgitates or goes backwards through that mitral valve into the filling chamber of the heart. And this can cause symptoms and changes in the heart muscle. If, it's, if there are no symptoms, then in general no treatment is required. If there are some symptoms or changes in the heart muscle, then some treatment may be used in the form of a vasodilator. This is a med medication that takes the load off the heart. But increasingly, we're paying some attention to the use of surgery to either repair or replace the mitral valve. And we're interested in doing this earlier to stop these changes in the heart muscle. So if you're diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse, you should continue to see your doctor regularly and be followed for screening. But in general, you should live a normal life and stay active. Well, the next question is about having a heart attack at a very young age and a question about what can be done about it. Well, the good news is that a lot can be done about it. And when anyone has a heart attack, one of the first things that happens is you look at risk factors. And risk factors for heart attacks include things like smoking, cholesterol measurements, obesity, exercise, diet, blood pressure, stress. These things are all very important, and most of them are changeable. And that's the good news. There is nothing more useful that you can do in reducing your risk of a heart attack than stopping smoking. But also exercise and diet. Diet that is low calorie, low fat, low salt, but high in fiber and high in multigrain carbohydrates. These things are going to significantly reduce your risk of heart disease. They're also going to help control obesity. Taking a walk is very easy and very important. You don't need to join a gym. You can take a 20 minute walk. You want to make it brisk so that you're getting your heart rate up and providing a challenge to your heart. It's a very powerful way to reduce the risk of heart attack. And for people who've had a heart attack at a very young age, it's possible there may be a family syndrome. And so you should pay a lot of attention to your cholesterol and see a specialist. In fact, here at Stanford, we're just starting a clinic for people who've had heart attacks at a very young age. And in that clinic, we'll pay a lot of attention to genetic factors and to cholesterol measurements as a way of working out why. The next question is about pacemakers and whether there are new advances in the field that would allow pacemakers uh, to be replaced. Well, many of you will know that the heart has a conduction system of its own, an electrical system, where there is a pacemaker, little cells at the top of the heart that make your heart beat normally. And when you exercise, they increase the rate of your heart. In certain people, and especially as they get older, that conduction system can get diseased. And sometimes a pacemaker is implanted in the heart. A little box is implanted just under the collarbone and a lead is tunneled into the heart. And this can take over the pacemaking function of the heart and can be a lifesaver for many patients. But of course, we're always interested in improving the technology. And there are some advances thinking about replacing the leads. So systems where a little receiver can be implanted in the heart and an alternating magnetic current can be used to turn that little receiver into a pacemaker. There's also biological approaches. So you may have heard of stem cells. These are special cells that can turn into any kind of cell in the body. And there's been interest recently in looking at those cells and injecting them into the hearts. And so far, these are only animal studies. But injecting these pacemaker cells into the heart to take over the function of old pacemaker cells that are no longer working. So there's plenty of good news on the horizon. And the next question is about genetics and lifestyle, and which of the two can explain more of heart disease? Well, the answer is, of course, both. Genetics and lifestyle both contribute significantly. And it's interesting that most of the studies that we've looked at suggest it probably is about half and half. In fact, some of the very classic studies, and these were ones that happened even before we could ever sequence a genome, happened in twins. As you might know, identical twins share the same genome, whereas non-identical twins have the same environment, but a completely different genome. 
And so we can look at those two things together and see and give an estimation of how much of the risk of heart disease comes from genetics. Those studies suggest that anywhere between about 30 and 60% of heart disease is explained by genetics. But environment remains to be very important. And as we move forward, we're going to try to work out exactly what it is about the genetics that explains that risk. So far, we haven't been very successful, but we're hoping in the new era with new sequencing technologies and new approaches that we'll be more successful in defining the exact genetic profile that contributes towards heart disease. The next question is about anger and whether that can cause heart disease. Certainly, there is very clear evidence that anger or depression is associated with heart disease. For example, in, a, in one particular study, a thousand medical students were given a questionnaire that ranked their degree of anger and followed up for 35 years. And after 35 years, it was found that the medical students who displayed more signs of anger in response to life events had more cardiac events. And this mirrors a, a large amount of evidence over many years that anger and depression can contribute to heart disease. There's some evidence, though a little less secure, that reversing anger by the use of relaxation techniques or avoiding stress or by treating depression can help heart disease. This affects not only individuals, but even populations. It's possible that after earthquakes or major disasters, we know that the heart attack rate goes up. And some of you may at the moment be following the Soccer World Cup. A very interesting study done in 1998 showed that on the day France won the Soccer World Cup, the number of heart attack deaths dropped on that day compared to the five days before or the five days after. So the message is stay calm, stay stress-free, and support the right team. And the next question is about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is a genetic disease of heart muscle which causes the heart muscle to thicken abnormally and can be associated with dangerous heart rhythms. It's the most common cause of sudden death in young people and athletes in the United States and is the most common inherited cardiovascular disease of all. And the question referred to whether if we pick up the disease early enough, can we stop the signs and symptoms of the disease later on with some therapy? Well, over the last 20 years, we have managed to work out the genetic basis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and now sequencing tests are available. So the gene mutation can be identified in perhaps 60% of patients who present with the disease. And there are now studies, in fact, one run out of Harvard University is currently enrolling, looking at whether intervention with a very common medication can stop the signs and symptoms of the disease later on. Another method of picking up the condition is to do screening of young people and populations. And although the question mentioned this has been done in Italy for many years, there's still a lot of debate about the best way to do this in the United States. Well, that's all the questions. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Thank you for watching. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.